Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to see those of you who are here for the uh, final presentation on this weekend spiritual revival entitled The Line of Distinction. I sincerely hope you had a very pleasant evening. I certainly did. I was contemplating this morning as I was preparing to come that many telephone calls went out either late last night or very early this morning to funeral homes or undertakers to come and collect the bodies of people who passed away during the night. That happened all over the world. But no calls were made to come and get you. Then you ask yourself, if around the world multiplied thousands of people died last night, why am I alive? God gave you life one more day for his business, not yours. Let me say that again. God could have taken your life last night because the life is his. First Chronicles 29, 14, all things come of God and of thine own, come of him and of thine own have we given him so that life is his to take as he chooses. What I'm asking you to dwell upon briefly, if God allowed you to live one more day, why? And it has to do with his business, not yours or mine. And so I just want you to accept this day as a gift from God and to make up your mind to serve him, glorify him in whatsoever you and I choose to do today. And it is my purpose to glorify him through this message by the help of his Holy Spirit. Uh, do me three favors before I begin. Favor number one, you have a cell phone. Please turn them off. Have you already done that? That's proactive thinking. Thank you very much. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, I would like you to pray for me. And I mean that from my heart. I'm not joking. Say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And favor number three, I very much would like you to think as you listen to the words of God. Let us bow our heads now and pray. Loving Father in heaven, we come to you, Father, asking you to be merciful to us. We make this request in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and your Son. Father, we do not possess the natural ability to understand truth. And so we pray that your sweet spirit, who inspired the writing of the Bible, will open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy word. Remember your words in 2 Samuel 23 verse 2 where David said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. Father, put your words in the very organ of my speech, my tongue. And I'll be careful to give you all the glory, the praise, and the honor which are due to your holy name. Hide me behind a cross. Let my voice be the voice of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I told you a couple of times this weekend that the Bible is a book of opposites. In Proverbs 8.36, the last clause of that verse, the Bible says, All they that hate me love death. And in that chapter, wisdom is a reference really to Christ. All those who hate Christ love death because Christ is life. Are you following me? If you hate Christ, you love death. There isn't a third choice. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 30, He that is not with me is against me. That's it. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. In Romans chapter 5, verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, 
judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. We have condemnation. We have justification. That's it. And in verse 19, Therefore, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. We have obedience. We have disobedience. That's it. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Those are the only two options. There's heaven and there's hell. When Abraham was negotiating with God in Genesis 18 verse 23, the Bible says, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Those are the two groups. And as I told you yesterday, Christ's Object Lessons, page 283, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes, There are only two classes in the world today, and only two classes will be recognized in the judgment. Those who violate God's law, and those who obey it. And on this quotation, I want to continue my remarks. There are only two classes in the world today. Those who violate the law of God, and those who obey it. Question for you, do not answer me. To which of the two classes do you belong? To which of the two classes does your church belong? On the basis of the principle of opposites, I want you to listen to a verse all Seventh-day Adventists should know. Revelation twelve seventeen. Say it with me. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we want to apply the principle or the law, the law or the rule of opposites and see what light flashes into your mind. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Now, the Bible doesn't say the dragon was wroth with the world. Satan is not angry with the world. John chapter, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, inspiration tells us, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness or darkness. If overwhelmingly the world is in darkness and wickedness, the world is in the condition Satan desires, and so he is not angry. I repeat, the dragon is not angry with the world. He is angry with the woman. Now, Revelation has two women. He is not angry with both. He is angry with one. And that church is identified, which keep the commandments of God. And let me pause on that item of identification. If Satan hates a commandment-keeping church, let's flip it. What churches does he love? Now, let's use the word commandment keeping. Let's keep the word commandment in the response. If Satan hates the commandment keeping woman, what woman does he love? The woman that breaks the commandments. If Satan is capable of love. Now, in Revelation, a woman represents what? A church. There are two women in Revelation, one in 12, one in 17. And the one in 17 has many daughters. Revelation 17, 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The mother of harlots. In order for a, har a woman to produce a harlot, what must she be? A harlot. Are you with me? A harlot produces harlots. 
Which means that since she's the mother of harlots, all the little harlots are just like mother harlot. Now, if a cat has kittens, let's say the cat has six kittens, there may be variations in the color of the kittens, but they're all what? Kittens. So this woman has daughters, and there may be variations among the daughters in outward expression, but the heart and soul of each one with respect to God's law is the same. The woman in Revelation 12 does not have many daughters. She is it. Are you with me? Numerically, there is a tremendous imbalance. You've got one woman, Revelation 12. You've got a woman and many daughters, Revelation 17. There is a numerical imbalance. In other words, the woman that the devil hates is vastly outnumbered by all the others that Satan has no problem with. Let me again stress the identifying mark. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God. Notice he went to make war with the remnant of her seed now. If it's the seed of the woman, then the seed cannot be different from the tree that produces it. Are you following me? An apple seed produces what? Apples. The same way a harlot produces little harlots. Now, the dragon was wroth with the woman. So he decides to make war with whom? The remnant of her seed. So we have the woman, we have the seed, then we have the remnant. The very last group that has the qualifying marks of this woman. Which is keeping the commandments of God. The Bible says Satan went to make war. What is the purpose of war? Destroy. Kill. Did Satan try to kill Christ? Yes, more than once. Well, in a certain sense, he did. Well, Christ actually gave up his life. But in a certain sense, we can say he did. All right, he succeeded, so he thought. The dragon was wroth with the woman, I repeat, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments. You and I live in an age where there is, according to Bible prophecy, a small group that are the target of Satan's military might. And he wants them wiped off the face of the earth. And who are they? The Bible says you can distinguish who they are by certain marks. One is they keep the commandments of God. That's repeated in Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What is so important about the commandments? What is the big thing about the commandments or the law? Well, keeping them is required, yes. Satan's problem with God is the law. Are you with me? As long as the law exists, Satan, he was frustrated in heaven in his rebellion. He's frustrated today. The law is a frustration for Satan. Now, if he can remove the law, every single created being would fall on his side. Notice I had every single created being. Where do you find created beings? Heaven and earth. The implication is that the same law God requires of us, he requires of the angels. When you and I pray, 
Let's begin the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. How? As it is in heaven. No variation. Now, what is the will of God? Thy will be done. A uh, not Acts, Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is in my heart. The will of God is the law of God. That's why Solomon can say, after looking back on his life, he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Finish that verse. For this is the whole duty of man. But he might have added the whole duty of angels. You see, God's law is the foundation of his government in heaven and on earth. Now, if Satan can remove it, the government of God collapses. Satan hates the law, what we call the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and he has masterfully attacked God's law to the degree that he has succeeded in employing, hiring, and recruiting preachers to get into pulpits and say the law is done away with. You think Satan is easy? That is a master stroke. He hires preachers to destroy God's law. The very ones that should defend it with their lives. I ask the question again, what is the big thing about God's law? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 49, paragraph 1, Ellen White writes, God placed man under law as an indispensable condition of his very existence. Now that sounds like carefully chosen language. You didn't hear me. If you were to rephrase that statement, what she's saying is, there is no existence, finish it for me, without law. Let me say it again. God placed man under law as an indispensable, what does indispensable mean? Essential, it's needed, can't do without it. As an indispensable condition of his very existence. What do you think she says? His very, just to be in the world, you need law. I don't mean to be scientific because I'm not a scientist. But I'm told matter exists in three basic forms. There are really five, but three basic forms. Solid, liquid, gas. Are there laws that govern the way solids behave? Yes. Are there laws that govern the way liquids behave? Yes. Are there laws that govern the behavior of gases? Yes. If that weren't the case, you and I could, we could not experience the transfer of oxygen from our lungs to the bloodstream. Are you listening to me? Now, the entire universe is composed of what? Matter. Then if all of matter is governed by law. You take away law, and what happens? Now, let's elevate our thinking to the moral level. You see, the physical world is designed by God to help us understand spiritual things. That's why Christ could tell parables. Let me give you an example. One of Newton's laws of motion, I, recall, I don't recall the first, second, or third, you tell me. An object in motion or at rest tends to remain in motion or at rest unless it is acted upon by an external force. And the external force has to be unbalanced to overcome the, 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 the inertia of the, the object. Now, 
Let's simplify that for those of you who didn't do whatever you didn't do. If a ball is rolling along the carpet and there is no force acting upon it, it will never stop rolling. The forces are usually gravity and friction. That's a law. But that physical law has a spiritual counterpart. Listen to it. Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Finish the verse. Neither indeed can be. In other words, a carnal mind is a ball of sin. And it is rolling. Can it stop itself? No. What has to stop it? What kind of force? An external force. Name that force Jesus Christ. Law. Now, let's go from the physical to the moral. If everything at the physical level is controlled by law, and the God of the moral is the God of the physical, and the God who created said, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the glory of God is God's character, can I conclude that moral law is optional? Now, I'm compelling you to think. What is water? Chemically, what is water? What does H2O mean? Two what? But what, what, don't tell me two parts. Speak to me scientifically. Two what? Two atoms of what? Hydrogen and one of? Okay. If you add one atom of oxygen more, you know what you have? Hydrogen peroxide. You don't have water. That minute change changes a life-giving liquid to a life-taking liquid. You don't run around drinking hydrogen peroxide unless you're mad. But it's close. But there's a law that says water is H2O. Mm -hmm. You change that and you face death. That's law. It functions the same way at the moral level. The soul that sinneth, it shall die or perish. Now what is sin? Sin is a transgression of the law. Ellen White writes in the Faith of Faith and Works, page 56, paragraph 1. Now we want to know what sin is. It is a transgression of the law. This is the only definition given in the scriptures. The Bible has one definition for sin, the transgression of the law. Now you may read in Proverbs, the thought of foolishness of sin. That's not a definition. That's an example. Let me explain. If I were to ask you, what is an animal? What is an animal? And you said a horse. Would you be right? Yes. But is that a definition? No. To define an animal, you may have to say an animal is a living organism that breathes and takes in energy by, you know, the, the food it eats and uh, it reproduces. And, you know, its it basic unit of energy is adenosine triphosphate. Now, that's a definition. But to tell me an, an, an animal is a horse, you are right, but you haven't defined. So when we say the thought of foolishness is sin, that's not a definition, that's an example. But when you say sin is the transgression of the law, that is a definition. When you break the Sabbath, you've broken God's law. When you break the commandment that says, thou shalt not steal, you've broken God's law. It is a law that keeps the moral universe together. And it is so essential that, listen to me, you know what the wages of sin is? Death. Now, since sin is a transgression of the law, let's rephrase it. The wages of, oh, but don't put sin, put something else. The wages of the transgression of the law is death. Now. 
Let's reflect on that. We've heard that all the time. When do I stop? 11.30? Okay. Think with me. Think. If you steal a banana in Los Angeles, do you get 10 years in jail? No. <laughs> Maybe, sister. <laughs> I don't want to live where you live. <laughs> if you steal a banana, the judge may slap you on the wrist and tell you, go and sweep the YMCA for two weeks. You steal a bicycle, you may get probation for six months. You steal a car, you may go to jail for a year. You know, as the severity of the crime increases, the severity of what increases, the punishment. But listen to God's system. If you steal a banana and you don't confess, what is God's punishment? Death. If you commit genocide, you destroy an entire nation and you don't confess, what's the punishment? The same death. Listen to me carefully. God has one response to sin. Death. Not because God is sadistic, because sin is so dangerous. When you go to the surgeon for cancer surgery, he doesn't spray perfume on it, make it smell nice. What does he try to do? Cut it out. Jesus said, if you're right, I offend you, put a band-aid on it. What did he say? Pluck it out. In other words, get rid of it. You got a boyfriend that's no good? <laughs> Don't take him to therapy. Get another one. <laughs> one who loves Jesus more than he loves you. And who is of the same church you are a member of. Somebody say amen. Law. Psalm 103 verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that are selling strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Which gets me back to a point I made earlier. The angels of God keep the commandments of God. God needs a people on this earth who will hold the line. And our subject is holding the line. And just won't budge. And that line is the Ten Commandments of God. You know, in the judgment, a lot of people say, I love Jesus. And God says, fine. Fine. You love Jesus? Yes. I'm born again. I'm saved. God said, fine. I'm going to find out in the judgment. You know what we find out? Not by what you've said, but by how you've lived. And so the Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith. But it also says, in the judgment, we are judged on the basis of what? Works. Obedience or disobedience. Revelation twenty two twelve. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his faith shall be. His works. And how does God judge the propriety or the impropriety of a work? He looks at it up against the law. Have you ever held something up to the light? The law is that light. So you say, Father, I have served you. I have loved Jesus. The Lord said, okay, hold on. Let me see. And he takes the record of your life. And he holds it up to the law. And he sees fornication, Sabbath breaking, stealing, praying to bits of stone that are shaped like people. And he says, what did you just say to me? That you follow Jesus? Do you know the character of Christ is expressed in his law? I don't see that in your life. The standard by which we are admitted to heaven is his law. A nice way to say it, the righteousness of Christ, but the righteousness of Christ is what the law expresses. Are you following me? And so the Bible says in Revelation 22, 14, another Seventh-day Adventist text, and I hope you understand what I mean by that. Blessed are they that 
do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now, why was it Adam lost the right to the tree of life? Sin. What is sin? Mm -hmm. Why did Adam lose the right to the tree of life? He transgressed the law. How will we get back to that tree of life? We obey the law through Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, Satan knows in the judgment the law is the standard. So here's what he has people doing. Here's a young man who's preparing for a physics exam, and he studies geometry. He is preparing for a physics exam, and he's studying, okay, geography. That's what he's studying. Ge Why are you reading so much geography? I am preparing for a physics exam. Now, when preparing for a physics exam, what do you study? Physics. If you're preparing for judgment based on the law, what should you study? The law. Not sin. Satan has people sinning in preparation for judgment based on the law. Are you following me? Because he knows if he gets you to live that life now in the judgment, you have no hope. Am I preaching legalism? No. You know what the jailer said to Paul in um, Acts 16, 30, 31? He said, sirs, who can finish that verse? What must I do to be saved? Now, that verse sounds like legalism, like he wants to say, what do I do to save myself? He didn't say, what must I do to save myself? He said, what must I do? To be saved, and if you extend that sentence, to be saved by somebody else. That's what he's saying. Are you listening to me? What must I do to be saved? To be saved means someone else does the saving, not him. But someone has to do what is required to let the Savior know you want to be saved. I didn't say that clearly. There are conditions to salvation. Are you with me? You don't just get saved. There are conditions to salvation. You know why Adam and Eve were not destroyed the instant they sinned? There was a condition. You know what the condition was? The sacrifice of Christ. Because Christ is the lamb slain from how far back? Yes. Now, he wasn't physically killed, but the power of the blood was in the promise. Because of that condition, even in the lost state, which they were before they accepted the robes from God, even in the lost state, they were given probation on the condition of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Are you following me? That was the condition on which God could spare them and give them a chance to come to him at his call. Because no one comes to God naturally. No one goes to God naturally. That's another sermon altogether. Condition. The condition of salvation is obedience. Now you say, come on, preacher, you just got into trouble because uh, Ephesians 2 verse 8 said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God. Fine. Let's not use one text to build the church. Let's build the church on the Bible. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Pause. When God gave, you and I were not around. Are you with me? There's some things God does with no input from us. The decision to send Christ was made before the world was created. So you and I had nothing to do with it. So the verse says, uh, uh, For God so loved the world that he gave of his own, that's grace, his only begotten son. Now here comes you and me. That whosoever... Believe it. Do you see a process in that expression? Do you see a chronology? What has to happen first? You've got to believe. Then what happens? You believe, then what? Look at the verse. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So you believe, then what? That's right, salvation. Now, who told you to believe? God. The word, God. Then when you believe, have you obeyed? 
Yes. Ah, you didn't get it. All those of you who got it, let me see your right hand. Ah, all right, I was wrong. <laughs> let me say it again. When the jailer said to Paul, uh, Acts 16.30, Sirs, to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? What did Paul say in verse 31? Believe on the Lord. And that's a process. That's a chronology. In other words, A comes before what? B. Are you with me? A is the condition. B is the fact. Paul said, here's what you do. Believe. But God is so good. Even when you have your part to do, he helps you to do it. Where does faith come from? For God has given to every man the measure of faith. Because you need to be saved by faith. But the carnal nature cannot produce faith. Are you following me? Don't just be nice. Be truthful. Are you following me? The, you see, Paul says, for I know that in me, Romans seven eighteen, that is in my flesh. Who can finish it? Dwelleth what? No good thing. Is faith a good thing? Come on, answer me. Is faith a good thing? Yes. Then if the carnal flesh has no good thing, is there faith in the carnal flesh? No. Then where does the faith have to come from? God. So God says, you know, to be saved, you need to believe. And God looks at you, you all carnal. Mm. He has to believe, but he can't believe. Well, this is serious. So God says, now, ex now exercise that. But the very desire to exercise it comes from God. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're not following me. Are you, are you? <laughs> the very desire, because the Bible says, there's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. And so not only do you need faith, but you need a desire to use that faith. The desire comes, God has given you everything you need to be saved. The only thing God will not do is choose for you. So the first says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now here comes your involvement, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. The believing is the condition. And when you believe, you have obeyed. Because it's God who told you to believe. The basis, the condition of salvation is obedience through Christ. And there's only one thing God wants you to obey. And that's the law. The Ten Commandments. Let me tell you something. Uh, and let me finish it. You cannot sin unless you violate the Ten Commandments. I don't care what you do. I'll say something else. There is nothing God expects of you that falls outside of the Ten Commandments. Because the Ten Commandments express what? The character of Christ. The righteousness of Christ. What is there outside of the character of Christ? Nothing. Remember, when man was made, God said, let us make man how? In our image. That ambition of God has not changed. He made man in his image. Man sinned, but God provided the gospel as a means of bringing us back to the original divine intention. Ella White writes, to restore in man the image of his maker. To bring him back to the perfection in which he was created. To promote the development of body, mind, and soul. That a divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of life. This is the great object of education. To bring us back. And a sinless life is an obedient life. And so we have a tree of life in Genesis 2. We have a tree of life in Revelation 22. We have a river in the garden in Genesis 2. We have a river in the new world in Revelation 22. Why? 
Eden lost, Eden restored. What is it that occurs between these two? Sin and the gospel. Two opposites. And the gospel's purpose is to give us a law-abiding mind. Said differently, a righteousness-loving mind. Like Christ. Hebrews 1.9, the Bible says of Christ, God himself said it, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth what? Righteousness. Righteousness is conformity with God's law. That's all that exists in the new world. We must practice it now to qualify. Satan does not want us to qualify. He does not want us to make it. And so he, 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 ex he exerts his power against the law. Satan is not upset because people go to church. Satan's best people are in church. Those who said crucify him were church people. Satan doesn't want you to obey the law because the law expresses the righteousness of Christ. The law is a foundation of God's government. An attack on the law is an attack on the character and the government of God. That is Satan's target. And the heart of the law is the Sabbath. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, God had to test them to see if they would obey the whole law. He tested them on one. God's thinking was, if I get them to obey this one, I know they'll obey all of them. Which one was that? The fourth commandment. The Sabbath commandment. And you can see how correct God was. Up to this day, that is the one commandment that the whole Christian world overwhelmingly disregards. You can see the success Satan has had, but he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments. There must be a small group of people holding the line. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His standard of righteousness has not changed. It has always been his law. It is his law today. The great standard of righteousness presented in the Old Testament has not been lowered in the New. It is not the purpose of God's, the gospel to lower the standards of God's holy law, but to bring men up to the place where they can keep its holy precepts. So the Bible says Jesus died for sin. How would you say that differently? Jesus died because of what? transgression of the law. So when the, the angel told Joseph in Matthew 1 21, and he shall save his people from their sins, what was he saving them from? Transgression of the law. Well, if he saves you from one thing, he has to save you to something. Are you listening to me? He saves you from disobedience to obedience. But to do that, he puts the law where? In your Bible? Does he put it in your pocket? Where does he put it? In your heart. Because what is in the heart is done how? If it's in your heart, how do you do it? With love? Naturally. Naturally. And so the Bible says of Jesus, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. The same law that was in the heart of Jesus is the same law, Jeremiah 31, 33, I will put my law in the inward parts and write it in the hearts. The same law in the heart of Christ is the law that's written in our hearts because we're supposed to have the same character of Jesus Christ. Because God is no respect of persons. The standard God had for Christ is the standard he has for you. If that were not the case, he would have put a different law in the heart of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, where did that law come from that was put in the heart of Christ? It came from the heart of God. Look at the process. From the heart of God to the heart of Christ to your heart. Now you understand. Let us make man how? In our image. Do you live a life that reflects the image of God? Don't answer me. You and I have been called and privileged and highly honored to defend God's law. 
to defend God's character, to defend righteousness. In the midst of an overwhelming tide of disobedience. All around you are groups of people who violate God's law. And they do it with words of praise on their lips. Because many of them don't know. When Aaron dedicated that golden calf in uh, Exodus 32 verses 5 to 6. He dedicated it to God. Now. The first commandment says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The people said, give us gods to take us back to Egypt. That's what they said. We need gods to take us back to Egypt. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The god they made was an image. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. They broke commandments one and two. And then the day was dedicated to God. What I'm saying, things have not changed. There are people right now worshiping this day which is secular, unblessed. And they have dedicated it to God. And they're doing it with an honest heart. But honesty and truth, or sincerity and truth, are not the same thing sometimes. A lot of people have a zeal, but not according to what? Knowledge. Do you see where you come in? People's eyes need to be open. Because there are people worshiping God suicidally. And they're really not worshiping God. But they don't know. They don't know. And those of us who presumably know we are so busy making a living in this life that we can't be bothered to open someone's eyes to make preparations for the life to come. We must make a commitment to hold the line. There is a law. And the problem with this world is not bad government. It's not economic strategies. It is not, mm -mm. the problem with this world is a disregard for the law of God. All of that can be said in one word. The problem of this world is sin. And the answer is Christ. And Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our obedience. Christ is our conformity with the law. Christ, when the law is in the heart, Christ is in the heart. No Christ, no law. No law, no Christ. I love God's law. Do I break it? Yes. Am I sorry? Yes. Do I love God's law? Yes. Do I desire to be faithful today? Yes, by his grace. Because the law is holy, just and good. There's nothing good in the flesh. The only way to keep a holy law is to be made holy. You didn't get it? It's six, uh, six minutes short of 11.30. Please get it quickly. Let me say it again. The only way, the Bible says in Romans 7.12, therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy, just, and good. Jesus said there's none good. Didn't he say that? If there's none good, there's none just. There's no one who's naturally holy. Then how can an unjust, no good, unholy person keep a holy law? You have to be made just, good, and holy. That process is called conversion. Now, that's not legalism. Legalism is the attempt of an unconverted person to get into heaven by doing things. Obedience is a natural response of a converted heart upon which is written the law of God. Are you following me? All right. Is God's law written on your heart? If it's written on your kidney, you'll obey God very, very miserably. If it's written on your spleen, it must be on your heart. Because the Bible says, out of the heart are the what? Issues of life. And when God writes the law on the heart, you know he writes nothing else? He writes nothing else. You're not following me. Jeremiah 31, 33. Hebrews 8, 10. Hebrews 10, 16. I will write my law and that's it. Because this is the whole duty of man. He does not write the church manual on your heart. Because if you have the law, you really don't need a manual. Now, don't go throw out your manual and give pastor heart problems. What I'm saying is, a church full of converted people don't need a manual. Because they've used the principle of value. Were you here yesterday? You are more important than I am. 
Let me tell you something. God only wrote the law. He did not write the Encyclopedia Britannica. He did not write your textbook. He did not write the manual. He did not write anything. How many offices you hold in the church? He wrote all he needed. That was the law. Then if that's all he wrote, and he wrote the law, what's the only proper response to a law? Obey. Then what is, all, what is it that God wants from you? Tell, oh, yes. If God wanted discussion, he would have written theories on your heart. I've told you too much in one message. I wanted so, so much, but no time. Listen to me. If you're not keeping God's law, make a decision now to keep it by his grace. Which one of you is living in violation of God's law? Raise your right hand. You're living in violation of God's law. Stand up. Stand up. Identify the law you're violating. Quietly in your heart. Identify it. I don't want to know what it is. Identify it. Now make a commitment quietly. Father, by your grace, change my resistant heart. Give me a heart on which is written by your spirit, your law. Ask God right now, Father, not just write, but engrave your law on my heart so that I will obey you as Jesus did with delight. And if the law you're breaking is a Sabbath commandment, make a decision now, Father, help me to start keeping the seventh-day Sabbath because it has never been changed. If God changes the fourth, he has to change the seventh, thou shalt not commit adultery. He can't change one. If he changes one, he has to change all. The commandments came to us from heaven to earth. Any changes must come from heaven to earth. Changes don't go from the earth to heaven. Are you following me? No, you didn't follow me. The commandments came from heaven and sent down to us. Any changes must come from the source of the commandments from heaven to earth. You don't change it on earth and send it back to heaven. Because you didn't invent it. It's not your law, it's God's law. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. Because the commandments are love. Love to you, love to our fellow man. That's all you require. Now these ten commandments, these ten laws, are your attempt to help a carnal mind to understand what it means to live a righteous life. These laws express a principle, and the principle is love. Please, God, as you said of your son in Hebrews 1, 9, thou hast loved righteousness, hated iniquity. Give us a heart that loves righteousness. And the opposite result will be a hatred for sin. Because we know from Scripture, you have a perfect hatred for sin. We want that. And we want a similarly perfect love for righteousness. Always being moved by the impulse of righteousness. Right doing. Conformity. With your beautiful law that the angels keep. All the universe is run by your law. Father, give us a heart that loves your law. Forgive us for our breaking of your law. And Father, as the prayers go up, as all your men and women, sons and daughters say, forgive me for transgressing and grant me a desire to obey you, answer that prayer. Because we need help from heaven to keep a holy law. Help us, dear God. Grant us your spirit. Save us when you come. And until that day, give us the spiritual courage to hold the line. Let the world know there is a law. And there's a group on this earth that keeps that law. With whom the dragon is angry. But we thank you, dear God, that you love us. So our concern is not the anger of the dragon, but your love for us. Help us to reward that love by loving you through faithful, heartfelt obedience. Let these words remain with us today. Use our lives to inspire others, I pray, from my heart. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you.